and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get the news and top selling games from November 1989. I test the Kempston Mouse. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and I end with a special find. But first, it's the news. CDs have been available for music for quite a while now, but now they can be used to start and load games into the spectrum. Well, one can at least. Codemasters are going to release a compilation on CD featuring 30 of their games, including BMX Simulator, Treasure Island Dizzy, ATV Simulator, and more. The games will load fast too, in about 20 seconds, thanks to a special converter that comes with the pack. A lead will then plug into the joystick port of a plus two and plus three, or a normal Kempston port for older machines, and using a normal CD player, games can be selected like music tracks and loaded straight into the machine. Could this be the start of a whole batch of similar compilations? The whole package will cost 19 95 The future has arrived on the spectrum. Games are still being released despite pressure from the ever-growing 16-bit market. US Gold are putting out Black Tiger, a clone of the arcade game alongside Crackdown. Dan Dare will see the third instalment of their popular games, and Infograms will also release Bobo very shortly. Postman Pat 2 will also be released soon, along with Sooty and Sweep, both from alternative software. If you've played Magnetic Scrolls games and found them a bit too hard, don't worry. A new book is about to be released that will feature complete solutions for many of their games. The titles included will be The Pawn, Jinxter, Guild of Thieves, Corruption and Fish. At last, after a very long wait, the Sam Coupe is set to launch just in time for Christmas. The machine, tipped to be the go-to upgrade for all Spectrum fans, mainly because it was Spectrum compatible, allegedly, but also it offered upgraded video and sound modes too, as well as a built-in floppy drive and more memory. The machine has been eagerly anticipated for a long time now, and the magazines are full of multi-page, full-colour adverts for this, hoping to build up excitement and entice people to part with their money. Miles Gordon Technology seems confident in sales, and they say they are expecting to increase production from the original 2,000 per week to 20,000 per week. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is New Zealand Story from Ocean. At number 4, Robocop from Ocean. Three, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade from US Gold. At two, what's called Batman 88, the Cape Crusader from Ocean. And at number one, Batman the Movie from Ocean. Seems Batman is having a good run. And that was the news and top selling games from November 1989. <laughs> There were three main competitors on the Spectrum when it came to mice, but mice were not very popular on the format because there wasn't really an operating system to support them, and there were very few titles that used them. Most mice came with an art package of some kind, but that was about it. I reviewed the Genius Mouse, also known as the Daytel Mouse, in a previous episode. This time though I'm taking a look at the Kempston Mouse. First released in early 1986 and costing nearly £70, this was not a light-hearted purchase. This mouse came with OCP Art Studio and an interface all ready to go. The design changed twice in its lifespan. Initially, the first version was a large, chunky piece of plastic with two oval buttons. This was replaced in 1987 or 1988 with something that looked more like the Genius Mouse, a lighter mouse with two oblong buttons. Kempston went bust back in July 1987, so maybe the design change was linked to that. The version I have, though, is the first one. The box is rather nicely designed and once inside you get the interface, the OCP Art Studio, and the mouse itself. Some versions came with a sort of mini operating system, but this can no longer be found. Someone somewhere must have it though, but so far it's still missing in action. The mouse is heavy, a well-made chunky piece of plastic that feels solid in the hand. Underneath is the ball, yes no lasers here, 
and a set of four small ball bearings that help things glide along, and I think this is a unique feature amongst mice, I've never seen it in any others so far. Setting it up is easy, you just plug in the interface, connect the mouse, and load whichever software you want. Because it has its own interface, I could not use the smart card, but I did try it and it didn't go too well. I also tried a div IDE and that didn't work either, so it was back to the TZX Juino for tape loading. Once OCP Art Studio loaded, the mouse didn't work, which was a huge disappointment. Not to be deterred though, I opened it up and cleaned the rollers and the contacts, gave everything a good clean and tried it again, and much to my surprise it worked. So once it was back together, it was time to try it out. OCP Art Studio works well, as you would expect, but the pointer moved a little slow. This is normal for mice on the Spectrum, and I got the same with the Genius version too. You can still use it though, if you're patient, using the drawing tools and fill tools, and obviously you need to be a more talented artist than I am to get the best out of it. Originally, as I mentioned, there were not a lot of titles released, but luckily there are quite a few now that have been hacked to work with it, and these can be found on the Velsoft website, and there's a large choice. I tried Batty first, and that was fine, although at times the mouse did stutter a little, but that's down to its age, I think. Another quick clean and it didn't give me any further problems. It had the same low resolution as the Genius mouse, so sometimes you had to lift the mouse up, move it across and drop it back onto the mat again just to get the cursor to move fast enough to play the game. Remember, this was manufactured over 33 years ago using 80s technology. Next I tried Galactic Gunners. Wow, this game is excellent. I reviewed it during the scramble shootout and it plays so much better with a mouse. I could play this all day. The mouse seems more responsive as well than playing it with say Batty and this makes the game brilliant. And finally, Nightmare on Robinson Street, an Operation Wolf-like shooter. You know the style of game, and the mouse worked fine here too. The Spectrum wasn't really designed for mice. The business tools were few and far between, and commercial games hardly ever got released that used them. For nostalgia, it's exciting to set up and try out. In real terms though, it's just a bit of fun, and not something you would have permanently connected. This is Halaga, released by Interceptor Micros in 1985. No guessing what this is then, I think the title gives it away. Galaga, or Galaga, depending on how you pronounce it, was a big hit in the arcades in 1981 and was the sequel to Galaxian. It had many more features than Galaxian and improved the game in many ways. There are very few versions of this game on the Spectrum that are not actual Galaxian clones when you closely examine them, so this one would be interesting to play. For those who are not familiar with the arcade, it's a shooter, and a good one at that. It takes Galaxian and adds more. More swooping aliens, more colours, more features. It is difficult to review such games though, other than move around and shoot things. The graphics are large, I think a little too large for this game, giving you very little room to manoeuvre. They move in blocks too, but they try to hide it, but it can be most visible when there are just a few aliens left on screen. Your ship looks very blocky too, and really needed to be a bit better. The alien patterns are familiar, and the game certainly gives you a challenge. In fact, I found it very challenging, as you can see. The alien missiles are so difficult to avoid, it can border on frustration at times. Um. 
Sound is well used, with a few different effects on offer, and there's a nice scrolling star field. For me though, I found the screen too claustrophobic, with not enough room to avoid things, which made for some very short games as you can see, and this is not ideal to keep the player coming back for more. If you like shooters, give it a try certainly, but be warned, it is difficult. This is a two-game compilation released by Tynesoft in 1986 according to World of Spectrum, or 1987 if you read the inlay. The two games included are One for the Road and Mutations. There's an interesting piece of history here, but let's get onto the games themselves first, and all will become clear. One for the Road then. The instructions state you have to drive your car around a maze picking up cat's eyes whilst watching out for marauding road signs. Sound familiar? Ooh, just wait. As you can see, it's a Pac-Man variant. You control a car that moves smoothly through a maze, picking up dots. Nothing really special here. There are oil tins in the corners that, when collected, allow you to kill road signs, although I'm not sure how you can exactly kill a road sign. There are bonus items to collect too. Sound is average, but nothing really special considering this was released in 1987. Or was it? It's more like a 1983 game really, or a particularly good type-in. Ooh, the plot thickens. Now, take a look at this game then. Pay attention to the maze layout and sound. This is a game called Macman, and this was a type-in from Your Spectrum in 1985. Look familiar? Well, it's the same game with different graphics. Yes, the game released by Tynesoft was a copy of a type-in from two years earlier. Hmm, let's have a look at the other game then. Obviously, this could be just an innocent mistake. This is Mutations, and here you have to fly around space destroying a series of different aliens. Some aliens are small, others form together into larger aliens, and these in turn come together to form eggs, and the cycle continues. You fly around using your scanner to locate them, and then you can go into a sort of 3D space shooting section to destroy them. There is a strategy here, you can kill all the aliens quickly and complete the game, or you can become a sort of gamekeeper, let them breed, kill a few and wait until the cycle continues and this will get you a higher score. This game is quite good once you get over the bland graphics, but hold on a moment. Take a look at this game. Look familiar? Yes, this is Spawn of Evil, released by DK Tronics in 1983. And it's the same game, just with slightly modified graphics. Tynesoft have ripped off another game, this time from five years previous. So I'll be honest, I obviously knew all this before I started the review, and there are a multitude of other games released by Tynesoft that are just mods of older games. The author of these modded games is a person called Harry S. Price. Is he real? No one knows. He was threatened with legal action a few times, especially when he released a game called Crime Busters, which was a modified version of Spellbound. Tynesoft gave some poor excuse that they could not check games submitted to them, but still they continued to release others that were clearly not legally theirs. There's a whole feature on this somewhere, but I'll probably be beaten to it by someone else. An interesting story then, but a nightmare for the original copyright owners. I wonder if anyone actually tracked down this Harry S. Price fella. This is ZX Larry, released in 2019 by Rafael Mayagsa. 
Do you remember those old DOS point and click saucy adventure games from Sierra? Yes, leisure suit Larry and his never ending quest for sex. Well, believe it or not, Larry has finally made it to the spectrum. Yes, it may seem unbelievable, but ZX Larry is a full point and click adventure. You can use the keyboard, or a joystick, or a Kempston mouse. Now for me, the keyboard and joystick options made the cursor move too fast, but you can slow it down by holding down the shift as you move. Or there is a patch for the game to be found on Spectrum Computing's forums. For this review, I'm going to use the Kempston mouse though, which links in with the special feature. The game works on a 48K machine, which is astonishing in itself. If you switch on AY sound in the emulator too, you get some nice music. There are a variety of commands on the left hand side to use, to control Larry as he wanders about, talking to people, looking at things, and generally getting on everyone's nerves. The game upholds the Larry series very well, and I really enjoyed playing this game. Examining things, talking to people, trying out different things, all brought back memories of those good old days and those games we used to play. A highly recommended game then, definitely give this one a try. This is Spectrum Golf, released by R&R Software in 1982. Yes, an 18-hole golf game on the 16K Spectrum. After entering the number of players and choosing either a 9 or 18-hole course, the course is drawn on screen very slowly using user-definable graphics. Trees, roof, fairway, bunkers and water can all be present. The game claims to generate these holes randomly, so no game should be the same, and after trying it a few times I can say the first hole is definitely different each time I've played it. Once you're ready to play, you're asked for a direction, and this relates to the numbers on a clock face. So to hit the ball right, you would enter 3, and you soon get the hang of this. You're then asked for a strength from 0 to 100, and the ball will magically appear where it lands. The same control is used throughout, until you make the putt. There's no club selection or any of that fancy stuff here. The game progresses at a nice steady pace, in silence. And if you like golf games, I suppose it isn't bad really. I mean, it's a 16k spectrum, what were you expecting? Fully animated players with wind? Ah uh, uh, no, that's a different game I'm thinking of. Anyway, I spent a good 30 minutes with this, believe it or not. No pressure, no fast reactions, just entering numbers and hoping to do well. Keep calm and play Spectrum Golf. So this, this month's topic is Bandersnatch, the Netflix special that Jeff and several other people asked us if we'd seen it and what we thought. So Jeff, you saw it before I did. I did. And your thoughts? I really liked it. I thought it was really, really good. It must have taken so much work to write and get right and record all those scenes and everything. I was, I was yeah. impressed. Your thoughts? It was quite impressive that, like you say, they must have filmed so many scenes because when you make a wrong decision, it then rewinds about three ch three decisions back and then replays it. Sometimes the scene slightly differently, sometimes from a different angle. So they must have filmed a lot of material to, to do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, my, my overall thoughts are I didn't like it. Really? In deadly silence. Did you, like, choose your own adventure books? I never never tried them. That's interesting, because I really love Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, yeah, well, I think for me that the whole premise, the whole film stood 
on the choice mechanism. If you put it as a standalone film, it wouldn't hold much interest apart from people that liked that era, apart from the you know like the Spectrum era. Mm. And yes, I liked all the nostalgia and the similarities between Imagine and what they did with Bandersnatch, and all the background stuff. I've since looked, and there's you know there are Chucky egg covers on shelves and jetpack posters in people's bedrooms and that sort of thing. Yeah. But I just thought, I don't know, I, I got, after about half an hour, I got fed up of making the choices when I just wanted to sit down and watch the film. And even then, some of the choices were a bit odd, particularly where the main character killed his father, or didn't kill his father, depending on the choice you made. Towards the end, and I think this is a Black Mirror staple anyway, it gets very dark. So there's no good ending. I don't think there's a good ending. Have you seen it all the way through? I've played it all the way through several times and got several different endings, having played it lots of times with lots of rewinds and then gone back to the start and tried again. Right, okay. I got as far as him killing his father and then I stopped watching. I, I don't know how far that's in. Is that near the end? That is near the end. You don't have to kill your father. <laughs> all right. Well, when I, when, I, when I didn't, it rolled back and I... And... I so then I chose to to do it and then it carried on and then I got bored, so I presumed that that was one of the branches you had to take. Um, I don't think it is. There are all different kinds of ways it can end. There was some interesting kind of references though. There was the um, nosedive game, which you can. Yeah, play. apparently I'm going to say apparently they set up a website that you could download and play that. Yeah, I've got it. I played it. It's okay. Right. Looks okay. good. I like I like the cameo by Jeff Minter. So Jeff Minter's supposed to be the guy. Whoa, 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 whoa! Jeff Minter was in it. I never saw Jeff. Yep, he um, he was the guy who wrote the original Bandersnatch book, who went crazy and killed his wife, I think, and family or something like that. But I, I, I just liked it. I thought it was a novel concept for TV. It's funny, I've had discussions with people over whether you play it or watch it. Do you play Bandersnatch mm. or do you watch it? Because you, you're kind of it's kind of interactive. It feels like a interactive game. Book. Yeah, it, it takes the interactive game a little bit further. You know, there's old ones with uh, Wild West ones and all the other ones that they they did on uh, video and laser disc. They did interactive games, that sort of thing. Yeah. I suppose it just it's just taking that a next step with a hell of a lot more material to be filmed. Yeah, it's interesting that you didn't enjoy it and I did. I suppose we're going down the, was it a game or was it not a game, um, really? Because obviously if it's a game, then the more choices, the more variety you're going to get. But it, it did steer you down a particular route. So if you got it wrong, it'd rewind. So. Yeah. yeah, if there was a game I was going to compare it to, it would be Dragon's Lair. Yeah. Yeah it, yeah, it definitely had that kind of Dragon's Lair feel, but you're just making choice do X, Y, or Z, kind of a game book type choice instead of choosing stuff with the joystick. And you definitely don't need to react as quick as you had to in Dragon's Lair. Yeah, well, but if, if that part where I bailed out was near the end, I might force myself to go through it again mm. just to get to the end. It'd be interesting to see what causes the different ends and how many different endings there are. There's some fun endings as well. There's a there's a very fourth wall breaking, break into a kind of vice type end, which right. is, is quite amusing, really. But... So there you go. Yep, there you go. Let's ban the snatch. Yep, a love bit. it or hate it, Marmite. It's a Marmite game, you either love it or hate it, and either watch it or play it, or whatever. In a recent batch of 16k games I purchased for the 16k section, I came across this, Rescue from Professional Software, released in 1983. A normal, early game you might think, and in fact it is written entirely in basic. But before we get to the interesting part, let's have a quick look at the game itself. You have to rescue a damsel in distress, seen at the top right of the screen. A giant spider is slowly moving towards her, and you have to get to her first and kill the spider. To do this, you have to climb the ladders one at a time. Before you climb the next one, however, you have to collect the little box of ammo on each level. Once you get to the top, you can shoot the spider, which will send it back to the left-hand side. But to kill it outright and complete the level, you have to be standing next to the damsel when you shoot. Like I said, nothing really special, and there are type-in games very similar to this. Now onto the interesting part. The instructions actually tell you to break into the game, and then play the rest of the tape for a tutorial.
Welcome to Professional Software's Basic Programming Course, Lesson 1. In this lesson, we will look at program structuring and two routines used in this game. First, let us consider program structuring. To structure a program means to split it into a number of separate routines, each doing a particular thing. And sure enough, the tape contains about 12 minutes of a man explaining each section of the game code, how it works, and giving tips on programming. I don't know if this is the author, a Mr. A. Blair. Starting value, 2000, print the ladder and the ammunition. Surely not Anthony Blair, you know, Tony Blair, the old Prime Minister? Anyway. We tell this routine which direction to move the rescuer by giving SH a plus value to move right, or a minus value to move left. When this program is running, SH will be set to either plus one or minus one. The audio I couldn't find anywhere on the internet, and I did put small excerpts upon my Patreon channel quite a while back. The tape was in a bit of a mess, and I had to patch three separate audio sections together to get the full version. I also had to do quite a few adjustments. In lines 3005 to 3020, we set the variable P string to the correct background. It's quite interesting and a good idea, I suppose. Children or people wanting to learn about coding can follow this and see how the game works. The full version will be available to my patrons first, and then I will send it to Spectrum Computing for inclusion in their archives. And I'll also add it to my own website. Now, I'm not sure if there's audio on any other games by professional software, because they're quite expensive to buy. But I would certainly be interested in finding out. It's always exciting to find new things for the Spectrum, especially if they haven't been heard or seen in over 30 years. That's the end of this side of the tape. To continue with the programming lesson, stop the tape, turn it over, and rewind it to the beginning. Then press the play button.